There can be only one podcast, and may it be the princes of the universe. Hi, folks, I'm Matt, and Bruce still isn't here because this is part two of my Doom Book reviews. Um, if you are catching in on part two and miss part one, go back to our last podcast. I go over everything starting with, I'm going through all of Frank Herbert's, and then later on, his son Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson's uh, Dune series. Uh, the part one start off, and we're doing this in chronological order as best I know how. And part one started with the but- Butlerian Jihad and ended with the actual Frank Herbert's Dune. So now I'm going to hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, go through the rest of the books here. And starting with Paul of Dune. Now this is one that his uh, Brian Herbert wrote with Kevin G. Anderson. And it basically just bridges the gap of what was going on between Dune and Messiah because in Dune Messiah so much has happened that the characters have all changed and so what Brian Herbert and Kevin Janderson decided to do is kind of fill in those blanks and tell you okay here's where everyone was and here's what happened and here's how we got to Dune Messiah is it necessary for us to know? No and I'm not really sure because I didn't I, I don't remember looking up any interviews where Brian said he was looking at his father's notes on this. Now he did look at his father's notes on a lot of things which is where they got some of the history of Dune and some ideas for the how the sequel was, was supposed to end. But as for you know Paul of Dune, I don't think there were any notes in there. Maybe he had looked at some of his dad's notes saying hey here's where they are now because this has happened and this has happened. So Kevin Janderson, uh, uh, Brian um, H- H- Hubert had uh, had to fill in, well, they felt like they had to fill in these blanks. I don't think you really needed it. But I'll be honest, this wasn't that bad a book. Going back over this, I don't remember what part of the trilogy this was. It was some unofficial trilogy that was taking place in between the gaps of each novel for the next, I think, three Frank Herbert books they were doing this. And for whatever reason, they decided to stop. But Paula Doom was the first one of those, and it's, it's all right. Uh, now, the next one after this goes to Frank Herbert, of course, and it is Dune Messiah. Just to sum it up, I, I can't remember. I, I want to say that Sci- Sci-Fi Channel did a movie on this, but I just don't remember it. I know they did Dune and they did Children of Dune, but they may have skipped Messiah. I don't know why. Messiah is pretty good. Um, basically, um, uh, it's uh, Paul... Well, yeah, I gotta give spoilers here. He loses his eyesight, is what happens. The war has gone so bad. He and Chani are gonna have a child. The child dies. He kind of foresees all of this and knows he's gonna lose his sight. Um, he gives everyone the Telexu can grow eyes, and he lets everyone have a new pair of eyes. He pays for them, but he doesn't want them himself because he is he's so knowledgeable and his cosmic knowledge has expanded since then that. He can see without eyes. And so he's even more of a legend than ever before, even though he has this quote-unquote handicap. Now, this one is a little bit better than the first book that has a lot of, and I believe the word I was looking for last week was dissertation or something. I I think that's the word. It sounds like it. But you have a lot of of uh, setup in the first book. This one kind of just plunges right in. Either he thinks that you've, he's assuming you've read the first book or he doesn't care. He's into his universe and you better get on board or just jump off the train at this point. Um, but, you know, Doom Messiah is a short one. I think this is the shortest book of them all. Rereading this book took me a little over a day on vacation. And really, I, I, I was only reading when the girls were taking naps or, you know, when, you know, they were just playing on the deck with me in the e- evening. And then that night finished it off. Well, the next morning finished it off, actually. So, you know, it wasn't that hard to read. I think dedicated a whole day. You could read in a whole day if you wanted to. But this is the only short, I should say not the only short one, but the shortest one that Frank Herbert ever wrote. So there's Doom Messiah. Now, of course, the next one is Children of Dune. Children of Dune kind of focuses on the kids. You know, he had a couple of kids after that. And so the kids, he had these two twins, and it's a boy and a girl, Leto II, named after his father. 
and it kind of focuses on them. He, it's years ago. By the way, I have to spoil Doom Messiah. Paul disappears. He walks into the sand, supposedly to his death, and he's never seen of again. Well, now there's this prophet who could be Paul, and they think he's Paul, but he preaches against Paul of Dune and Muad'Dib, you know. And his sister, who's slowly going insane now, it's kind of sad. His sister was a strong character, kind of all together, you know, sensible. They called her the abomination in the first book. In the second book, they kind of focus on that. She is, uh, I can't remember, Alia the Knife is what they call her. And you don't know why she got the knife nickname until Paul of Dune. So that was kind of nice. Unnecessary, unnecessary to tell us how she got the name, but, you know, nice to know. And now in this book, she's totally gone insane. Uh, She's kind of on spice a lot, so drugged out a lot, and it's kind of messed with her brain. She's fallen in love with a clone of Duncan Idaho, and but and and but Duncan is ba- basically leaves her at the very beginning because he sees that she, they're going in different ways. And inside of her psyche is the Baron Hakonin who she killed, and his spirit or whatever is sometimes possessing her, but a lot of times just talking to her. He's inside her inside of her mind talking to her and telling her to do awful things and she's starting to listen now so she's slowly getting torn apart now she hates this prophet you know because it's tearing down her beloved brother so she wants the prophet dead but then later on i don't eh, i I don't want to give many spoilers here but it is paul (laughs) it is and so it's one of those things that he and uh, his son, you know, he, talk, he talks with Leto. Leto's talking about the golden path, something that Leto has to do going forward. Um, I won't discuss the fate of Paul afterwards, after Messiah and Children of Dune, but now Leto must take up the golden path and must follow the, his way. Uh, his sister, Paul's sister, is finally uh, given an end. It's not, a, it's not a good ending. It's a tragic ending she's given. And then... Uh, Leto basically embarks upon the path. He slowly is going to become a worm, and that's what you hear about. He's running on the sand. He's enjoying life right now as fast as he can because pretty soon he'll be a <clears throat> emotionless worm. This is really kind of weird when you think about it, but it's not a bad story. It's actually pretty good and kind of ends on something that you think is hopeful, but it is a the golden path is a dark path. And he's about to become a tyrant. Now, before you go into that, you got to go into the uh, second book. And I don't remember what the what series was called. I want to say it was the Paul of Dune trilogy. But part two and the last part that ever came out. They never did a book three, and we never heard what was going to happen to it. But it was called Winds of Dune. Basically, Paul hires an old friend, uh, Paul of Dune, before he dies. Um, he hires someone to trash his name. Say, hey, just just totally, everyone's built me up to be this Superman. Make me a regular person. And so his friend is doing this. Well, no one knows this, by the way. I guess that's one of the big spoilers there. No one really knows it till the end. But there's this guy spreading falsehood, saying that pa- Muad'Dib was not that great a person and yada, 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 even though this is one of uh, Paul's friends. And Paul's mother is telling the story about this guy and says, hey, he wasn't always this way. And so it's a little bit of a flashback, plus, you know, they get back in the present here and there. They go back, kind of back and forth. But mainly it, it takes place in the past to tell you how Paul and this guy met up and what kind of adventures they had when they were boys. So <clears throat> it kind of ends that way where, you know, it's revealed that, hey, P- Paul, your son told me to do this. I'm just trying to, you know, he, he didn't want to be no, known as a god. He just wanted to be known as a regular person. And it's a pretty good one, too. I, I remember a long time ago, and if you would have asked me before I reread these, I would have told you that Winds of Dune is the weakest one in the series. It's the one I enjoyed the least because I just felt like it was just a bunch of stories about what happened in the past. But after I was reading it, I was like, ah, you know what? I'm, I'm engaged. I'm engaged the whole time. This isn't that bad. And these three trilogy, this trilogy, whatever it's supposed to be about, was so loosely tied together, I guess they figured that they just didn't care about writing a third one or didn't know what another topic would be about. Because like I said, just like Paul of Dune, and more, more than Paul of Dune, this story was unnecessary. 
It was just really, it doesn't move the story anywhere. It doesn't connect pieces except for, you know, other Dune um, series, but doesn't answer any questions or reveal any secrets, something we don't know. And I'm guessing, like I said, I, <clears throat> I totally didn't study this back when I was buying them and talking to Kevin J. Anderson, but I'm guessing they just decided that, you know, it's not worth doing a third one, and they dropped it and went with something else. I'm assuming that's what happened. So uh, anyway, they, they dropped that, but it's, there's nothing really that's left out there, like some kind of you know cliffhanger from this quote-unquote trilogy. It seems like a trilogy of separate stories. So nothing's there to resolve, really. I mean, there's maybe a few things here and there they kind of put a hint in. But other than that, you can just read them both and be happy with the endings of Paul of Dune and Winds of Dune. All right. Um, Paul, this, uh, the next one is from Frank Herbert, if we're doing, going in chronological order here, and it's called God Emperor of Dune. Well, now Leto II has turned into this giant worm. He has This is thousands of years in the future. He's basically known as the tyrant. He rules with an iron fist. He, you know, he controls the spice and no one else can uh, get it. And he's just kind of you know, brought the universe underneath his heel. And it's for a purpose. What purpose, we don't know. He says it's for the purpose of mankind. Now, um, he uh, has a weakness. He does have a heart, even though he doesn't want to show people that, that he can love is the thing. The worm can love. But he loves Duncan Idaho for some reason. I guess as a kid, he has good memories of him. And ever since Duncan, you know, the clone Duncan died, uh, natural causes, it, it, I believe, the, the first clone that we hear about, because the original Duncan Idaho died during Dune and then got re-cloned in Frank Herbert's series. So I guess Frank Herbert really liked the character of Duncan Idaho, or he just decided he liked him and he wanted to bring him back, so cloning was brought in to the world. But really, the only person who's getting cloned is Duncan Idaho, and he's getting cloned hundreds of times. In fact, through the centuries, through the millennia even, uh, Leto II has continually cloned Duncan Idaho's for his purpose, to serve as his right-hand man. Now, we don't know how many, but eventually all of these Duncans turn on Leto II because they realize he is a tyrant, he is a bad person, and we must kill him. But each Duncan Idaho fails. They fail in their mission to take down Leto II. And we we come in, like I said, about four thousand, four or five thousand years past Children of Dune. And again, this is where the series kind of gets weird in a way, because you're like, okay, so Leto's a worm now, but with the face of a man. You know, he, he has the body of a worm, but his face is embedded where the worm's head would be. But it's embedded inside of worm, like it's just a face on top of a worm. Kind of weird. But <laughs> but anyway, that's that's what Leto the Second looks like now, and his skin is impenetrable, no poison, no laser beams, nothing can cut or hurt his skin. Um, though he secretly knows he is getting, uh, he has one weakness and it is water. Over the years, he can't drink it anymore. He can't, if it, if it rains, it, it bothers his skin, it irritates his skin. And so he knows, he realizes slowly, slowly that water is his big weakness. But he tells no one. And since water on Dune is very precious commodity and whatnot, um, by the way, Dune has gone through so many eco ecological changes at this point, it's ridiculous. Um, if you know Liet Kynes, the uh, plant, planet, uh, I can't remember what he's called in it, planetologist, uh, is trying to revert the desert world into a paradise. Well, eventually they do that where there isn't much desert left. And then Children of Dune, is basically a, Dune is basically a paradise with very little desert. Well, years later, Leto reverses that decision and makes it all desert again instead of, you know, leafy green. And but it's still it's they still have rain. There's still water here and there. There's still nice patches of paradise here, but he knows that water uh, over the years has grown to be his big weakness. He won't tell anyone. There's a lot of things he won't tell anyone. He makes lots of books to keep his prosperity, you know, his name for years to come. But he doesn't tell anyone his weakness. Now we we come into the story where there's a new, a brand new clone. I think, who, well, maybe he just killed the clone, and now a new one's coming in. 
and he's, you know, it's the same thing over and over again. He's he's omnipresent. He knows everything. He knows what's going to happen. Now, for some reason, he made a deal with himself that he, he made a promise to himself. He would never look past 4,000 years, which is coming up. And so pretty soon, he won't know what's going on. And we're getting to that point now where everything's a, things are starting to surprise him. And he likes surprises now because it's been boring looking into the future and seeing everything. That he just and he always made this promise he would never look past that, so he knows his end could be near more so than ever. Um, they clone some kind of girl or give him some kind of girl who is bred or, or you know designed her DNA structure is designed for the worm to fall in love with and she's to fall in love with him. Kind of weird. He knows it's a trap. He knows this is his end, but he does love this woman. It's like I said, it's just it's a little weird. But uh, so they fall in love. They're going to be married. She's going to happily marry the worm, and he's going to be happy in love. But again, he also knows his end is coming. Meanwhile, this Duncan is trying to figure out what happened to all the other Duncans, what's going on with the worm, what he should do, you know. And then eventually, he's coming to the same um, suggestions. To he, he actually comes across the family of his uh, his family from a prior clone. So he's kind of piecing together the uh, past uh, clones of his life. And kind of stringing them all together and saying, okay, well, we got to kill him, but how? And so, of course, he kind of comes to that decision, too, but he's a little bit different. And Leto II even acknowledges that by saying, wow, you know, you've, you've surprised me a few times here and there. Uh, this is, it's weird because it feels like a lot's going on, but really not that much is going on. Uh, in the end, Leto will die. Um, he will be, there will be an assassination or assassination attempt that will be successful and kind of leave Duncan Idaho in charge now in a new direction for the universe. And this is what Leto said. He said, I just need to set everyone on this path, and now hopefully it'll save humanity or whatnot. We don't know what that means. In fact, it's arguable if we ever know what that means, especially from Frank Herbert. But he obviously had an idea for this, and he wanted to do He wanted to, uh, to do that, uh, kind of have that premise set forth in his next books going forward. I think at God Emperor of Dune, he had an idea of where he wanted to go. He did get derailed, I believe. Frank Herbert got off point a couple of times, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, God Emperor of Dune is, I, I used to tell everyone, Dune is really good until you get to God Emperor. It makes get a little weird, and then you keep moving. But I was wrong. God Emperor of Dune is not weird. It's the next ones that are weird. <laughs> and that's because his wife passed away. His wife passes away, and his books really change. They really change, and they really get weird. And you're just so confused for these last two books. They're not bad, but one is just... Uh, let me go through. Heretics of Dune is the first one. Basically, when his wife passed away, he, he, you know, he loved his wife, and uh, she loved the Bene Gesserit, which is the witches, who are usually the villains. They are the... You, you always hate them. You, in every Frank Herbert book, you were taught to hate them, hate them, hate them. Well, now, even thousands of years later, Heretics of Dune, even though we don't know politically what's going on in the world, we never find that out. If they explained it, I don't know. I got lost in it. And I tried to pay attention to this because I knew this is where it got weird for me. Um, but everything's upside down. Like The Bene Gesserit are now the good guys, but there's bad Bene Gesserit and good Bene Gesserit, and they're, I can't remember their names right now. Um, <clears throat> but... It gets really weird. Like they, their plan to breed the perfect, you know, um, human or whatever superhuman to save the race is back in effect again. And uh, they, they, they were all, even though they had evil, you know, even though they may not have the best intentions at times, or you know, they weren't the best people at times. They had good intentions all along. All along, they were trying to save the universe. And he was just trying to switch the story up for his wife, who really loved the Bene Gesserit and really wanted them to be the good guys, I guess. So he flips them around. It takes some use. It takes some getting used to. Now they've cloned another Duncan because Frank Herbert was in love with Duncan Idaho, and this Duncan they're going to try to trigger all his memories, uh, not just when he died the very first time around, but all of his memories. You know, sometimes you trigger him and it just remembers. He remembers his prior life, the life that he was cloned from. But they do something this time that triggers all of his memories. And what they do is have sex with him. That I'm not lying. And in fact, it's 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 like a sleazy, smutty, 
romance novel too. It's it's really it was worse than even I remembered, and I remembered it being awkward and bad. But I was like, oh my gosh! I mean, think of the sleaziest, smutty. Think of Fifty Shades of Grey, but a little bit worse. I mean, they really go into detail. And Duncan Idaho's a kid, so it kind of makes it a little. You know, you feel you need a little shower once you watch this. Once you read this, it's not. I, I can see Hollywood going, ooh, even we aren't that. We aren't that bold to make that. So it was really awkward and doesn't really fit in with anything else you see in Dune, um, which is another reason why Heretics of Dune just isn't that good, in my opinion. And uh, But anyway, it triggers his all of his memories from all of the prior clones. He knows everything. And the girl who tried to bond him uh, sexually, she is now bonded to Duncan, too. She didn't realize that Duncan could bond, too. And... So now she's kind of under the control and sway of Duncan Idaho. And, th- and that's important because later on she will rise up to control both houses of the Bene Gesserit. So Duncan's in a pretty good position. We then get to uh, Chapter House Dune, which I'll be honest, this is the, the, it's a hard read. It's so boring, nothing's really happening, and everything is confusing. Everything is confusing. At least Heretics had some sort of premise, but it was really bad. Chapter House Dune, it, this one, this is the one, and it's not bigger than any other Frank Herbert novel. It just took me the longest because it was a chore to read through. It was it was such a chore because I'd have to chip away a few chapters at a time, and none of it was good. None of it was interesting. There are so many characters at that point you really don't care. For some reason, there's a rabbi. He's called the rabbi and his daughter Rebecca, and you're like, well, where did these people come from? What? There, there's Jews in space? I don't, what, what is going on? Why, why all of a sudden did you do this? Because we never hear about rabbis before, but I don't know. Frank Herbert decided, oh, let me throw a rabbi in there. I don't know what he was thinking. So it's just really weird at this point. Um, it's This is the toughest book, the toughest book to read. I, wouldn't, I was going to say skip it, but I don't know how relative it is. I know you would probably need it just to know the characters, I guess, for the last two books which his son and Kevin Janerson kind of wrapped up the main Dune storyline with. But, ooh, this is a hard read. Chapter House Dune is the worst of them all just because it's just so boring and nothing happens. In the end, Duncan Idaho flies away with, I think, the last remaining Telexu cloner, master cloner, of course, the rabbi and his daughter. And it's just a small group of them that get away from the busy Bene Gesserit, his wife with two daughters. He just leaves them all. They're babies at the time. But he just leaves them because he knows he has to go on his own. He can't help serve the Bene Gesserit. Now I guess they're evil again or they're the bad guy or they're misguided where they worked so hard to tell us they were the good guys and heretics of Dune. Uh, Again, this is not making sense to me either. But uh, that is the end of Frank Herbert's writing. Now I remember when I first read all of Frank Herbert's Dune, I thought, oh man, it doesn't end. I didn't know it didn't end. And for years, uh, Kevin Janerson said that Brian Herbert would not let him touch his father's story. He said, no, that's my father's story. We need to leave it unended. We, just, we can do you know, stories of what happened previously, but we can't do a story of what happened after uh, Chapter House Dune. Well, I guess because of you know, all the money coming in from the previous sales of the other Dune novels, Brian Herbert finally relented and said, yeah, let's do it. Now, Kevin Janerson said he was just happy with the quality of work they've been producing and then opened up the books to Kevin J. Anderson, who's a huge Dune fan, and was excited to see what uh, Frank Herbert had in mind. And those last two books are called Hunters of Dune and Sandworms of Dune. I'm going to kind of talk about them together since it's basically a continuation of Frank Herbert's original story, and it does, it does give it an ending, where I don't think you should, you, they shouldn't make any more after this, because this is kind of like the happy ending. It all concludes. Um... <clears throat> Basically, we find who the master Harritz Carritz is, the Harry Carry. I don't, I can't remember. The, I don't know how to pronounce that the name, but we find who the you know the the super Harritz Carritz is. And there's a great at the end of uh, Sandworms of Dune. There's a great like five or four level twist in there. Like you're trying to guess who it is. You think it's so and so. It's not. Okay, then it's that person. No, it's not. Maybe it's this person? No. Oh, it's that person. Yeah, it's four people, I think. It goes through, but each one you are believing, oh, they are the chosen one. No, they're not. Oh, my gosh. Oh, that's the chosen one? Oh, no. Oh, no, they're not. Oh, wait, that's the chosen one. No. Well, who's the chosen one? Whoa, 
that's the chosen one. <laughs> it's really good. It's a really good ending. Um, other than that, there is, and I am going to do a little bit of spoiler here because I am talking about the ending here. Not too much. I won't go into too much, but they have to do something to tie everything together. And so Brian Herbert and Kevin Janderson wanted to put their prequels into the ending. So welcome, they start talking about cloning. They clone just about everyone at the end of this. All the original people from Dune, you know, the original peak characters you know are recloned. And, and Hunters and Sandworms of Dune, so you can have that familiarity with the series. And then they even talk about cloning some of their past characters, Selena Butler and um, you know the first Harkonnen and stuff like that. They're trying to, uh, Absolute, I think his name was, but they're trying to, they're thinking about cloning all these other people from the prequel books that you remembered. And of course the villains that come back are the two robots, Ominous and Erasmus. They're still alive for some reason reason and they have an army I don't know it's really weird because we were told we were given a perfect ending to Ominous and Erasmus All right, spoiled the ending of Erasmus which is beautiful bringing them back here I understand because I guess Frank Herbert always wanted the thinking machines to return and they were like oh dang you know Kevin J. Anderson or Brian Herbert said well we already ended that because we didn't think we were going to you know use the thinking machines anymore because Brian was against us ending the story so now what do we do well, let's just bring them back. Let's say there was a backup copy. There's always a backup copy. And it just seemed to, che- it definitely cheapens Erasmus' death by far. But then Ominous, you're like, oh, he's back. Now, of course, if Ominous is back, you got to bring back Erasmus. Someone with some interest. Uh, Ominous is not interesting at all. It's not interesting at all. And he's, he was never meant to be interesting. He's just a computer. So, but they could have brought him back just just as himself, but they thought, no, we need to give them some better dialogue, so let's bring Erasmus back too. It really cheapened. It's like, you know, I I didn't like Commander Data's uh, second death in uh, Picard series. It cheapened his death from the first time around, the movie Nemesis. So, you know, uh, this is kind of what it feels like. What if you had a great death scene, and then they brought you back later on? You're like, oh, I don't like that. And that's kind of what they did with Erasmus and Ominous. They they told you it was the end for good for both of them, and now here they are back again because it's a backup copy. And you really don't buy into it. And, I, like again, I understand. This is probably in Frank Herbert's writing that there had to be a... Uh, a threat, so they decide to bring back some characters and kind of tie it in from the very first series. But it doesn't feel the same. It, like I said, it feels anticlimactic having them there. And just, I mean, Erasmus. Uh, should I spoil that? I mean, Erasmus gets a different ending this time. But I like the ending where he just he dies. He sacrifice. He he cares about his well being more than anything. His preservation. But yet, in the original ending, his death, he didn't care. He would rather die, die for love. Where in this one, he kind of uh, fast forward a minute. Here we go. Spoilers. He merges with Duncan Idaho. So Duncan is part machine as well, and. Duncan has all the secrets of the Telexu, all the secrets of machines. Now machines can be used again in our world. We can control them again, and we'll be at peace with the machines and whatnot. And I don't know. I don't know. That doesn't, because Erasmus has always been trying to be more human, and this is his path. He will learn from Duncan as Duncan will learn from him. And you're like, no, no, no. That totally ruins the beautiful death that he had in the previous books. So in my opinion, that part of it, no good. No good. Didn't like that. That's the one big thing I didn't like about these. Other than that, Hunters and Sandworms of Dune are good. So overall, here we go. Final thoughts. Made it through them all. Should you read them? Nah. Yeah. Yeah. Get get the paperbacks. Remember, don't forget your library, folks. Libraries have all these. A lot of them on digital. But if they don't have them in their library, they can also order you the book from a, a, a surrounding library and get it to you. Read it that way if you're looking for stuff to read. Yeah, the Doom books are pretty good as a science fiction thing. They pale in comparison to uh, a lot of other worlds. Firefly, Star Trek, Star Wars, Babylon 5. There's probably a few more out there they do compel in. But Dune is actually pretty interesting. I do. I am grateful that I got to read them all again. And yeah, one one day more, I will give them another reread eventually in the future. So I enjoyed them. And so that's my total review of all of the Doom books. Hey, have you read the Doom books? 
If so, what did you think about them? Do you agree or disagree with my statement? Have you read the newest book? Please don't give me any spoilers, but did you like that one? I plan to read that one when it's all finished in a few years from now. But uh, yeah, that's it for Dune, and hopefully, folks, next week we'll have Bruce back. If not, then eh, I'll find some other book series to uh, talk to you about. All right, folks, I'll see you next time on Princes of the Universe.